Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experience enriching your most important relationships. I'm Dr. Don Welch, your host and moderator. Let's face it, each and every one of us is challenged in at least one or more relationships at work, around home, in marriage with children and friendships. We all desire healthy relationships. Why then do some interactions ignite intensely negative emotions while other relationships nurture the more meaningful moments in life. During this next segment, relationship specialists will respond to questions from a live audience while offering practical solutions. It's like having your very own psychotherapist in your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we now connect with a live audience and my therapist says. Good evening and welcome to My Therapist Says here at Skyline Church. And we welcome you to a very, very important topic here at the first of the year. I'm uh, Dr. Don Welch, the counseling pastor here at Skyline Church, and we welcome you and other friends and guests that you might bring to our once a month My Therapist Says. It's the, usually the very first Wednesday of the month. We've been doing this for a number of years. We're now in the 80s of how many of these presentations that we've accomplished. We someday hope to have them on DVD available for those who would like to listen to these topics. I'm expectantly enthused about uh, this evening because we have uh, a real special guest with us, uh, a very good friend of mine, colleague uh, in his own rights, a very powerful pastor, uh, Dennis Estelle. And then we also have two people from a PERT team, that means that these two individuals are actually going out and responding, first responders, if you will, to tragedies, catastrophic issues where people are, are hurting deeply. And so this topic is really important for us, and it's working on managing uh, depression and how to prevent uh, suicide. I can't think of a more important topic than this. So we welcome you this evening. Uh, we're going to have some fun as we talk about a very, very delicate and challenging topic. But as we get ready tonight, I just want to mention, if you've not been to My Therapist Says, just want you to know that the audios of these are available. We do have four cameras tonight videotaping uh, this session. Uh, normally, we live stream, but we have some challenges this evening, so we will not be live streaming. Typically, it is live streaming just at the time of the presentation each first Wednesday of, of the month want to just let you know how you may participate. This is really developed in a way that it's integrated with you as the audience. We will have about a 15-minute presentation, and then the rest of the evening we'll be discussing the questions that you raise on that 3 by 5 card. Would you raise that in the air to make sure that... I know you have one. I, I know our hosts are always very good. I always like to have you raise it. I'm, uh, I'm an old university professor now, 25 years, and so I'm always trying to get some sort of interaction. Thank you. And there's some hands that are raised that you already have your question. Is that correct? Raise those up if you already have your question. There's one down here. There's another one here. It feels like I'm raising money for the sanctuary, but we, we don't need to do that. Our lead pastor is not here uh, this evening. But if you do have a, if you'd raise it in the air, our hosts are coming by. They will collect the questions. Here's a question right down here. Just keep it in the air. At any time during the evening, just raise that card in the air. And if you'd like another card, just raise your hand without the card. And then we will collect those, they'll bring them to me, and I will serve as the moderator this evening. So welcome, and would like to have a word of prayer as we begin this evening. Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of hope and peace. When those are lacking, we go to despair and darkness. And tonight as we talk about a very important topic, I'm reminded of the first of the Beatitudes one of the very first things you said, Jesus, was blessed are the poor in spirit. And you know how important it is to be able to have a level of health where we are not in a severely depressed state. Not one of us has been without some level of depression. It's the way we're made. We, we ebb and flow. And yet when someone goes to a very low level, it can be a very despondent, tragic experience. So tonight, Father, we pray that those who are listening in at another time, and those who are here this evening, we pray for your presence that makes all the difference. You're the one who commonly and repeatedly said, fear not, I am coming to you. You're the one who said, I give you peace, not as the world gives unto you. 
And we pray, Father, that we would sense your peace. That's the peace. That's the absence of fear. And fear and anxiety coexist. And typically, there's a level of depression that manifests in the midst of all that. So we pray your blessings. And as we listen to you tonight, you are the healer. We as humans like to come alongside and and support the work that you're already doing. So we count on you, Father, this evening that you would bless our time, guide it, and we will give you praise for all that you are going to accomplish this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have those cards, if you just raise them at this time and and bring them forward, um, I'd just like to briefly introduce uh, Brian Cordoza, who is uh, uh, working with the Sheriff's Department as part of uh, the team, and then Kim Bozart, who is also working with the Sheriff's Department as part of a PERT team. And they'll explain more of what PERT means. I've been saying that, but yet not explaining it. But they are the, the first responders to tragic uh, situations. And so they have enormous skill. This is quite an unusual presentation tonight to have both a very uh, skilled therapist in Dennis and then these two people who have tremendous skill in knowing how to respond to very delicate again, situations. And then I did mention also Dennis, uh, who is with us. So the three of you, thank you. At this time, we will have uh, about a 15, 20-minute presentation. Following that, we will dive right into your questions and respond to the questions that you have raised or will raise this evening. Brian and Kim? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'll start with our first slide. It's uh, recognition and management of suicidal behavior. And this is my coworker, Kim, and I'm Brian Cardoza. Yes. Um, okay, like Brian said, my name is Kim. Thank you very much for inviting us here tonight and coming to listen to us speak. So, like the pastor said, we work for PERT. It's the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. So we're licensed clinicians and registered nurses throughout all of San Diego County, and we partner up with law enforcement. So we sit in the front seat of the patrol cars, and we actually come and respond to the 911 calls. We primarily respond to the ones that have the mental health component. So we go out, talk with people, see where they're at, and see how we can help them Um, in the most effective manner, and in the quickest way possible also. And our objectives objectives tonight, uh, we're going to go through the signs and symptoms of depression. Uh, We'll discuss risk risk factors. Uh, We'll address concerns, and we'll also go over some resources for help in the community. First off, we'll go ahead and start with depression. Um, Some of the things you'll see when someone is severely depressed um, you'll see that they have a, um, a sad appearance. They can have a lack of energy. Uh, you'll notice that they're sleeping a lot. Uh, sometimes people will stay in their beds all day, really have a lack of energy, and um, really no ability to get out and do the things that they normally enjoy doing. Um, they might isolate from their family and their friends. So maybe um, a family member, again, they, they're staying in their room a lot. They're not going out and joining those family activities that they normally do. Uh, they can even have a decreased, decreased appetite, so you can notice late, uh, weight loss. Um, you'll see that physically manifesting because they're not eating, so that's another warning symptom that you would want to look for. Uh, they might describe feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, uh, making statements saying that you know they're just no good, they can't get any things done correctly, um, or that they feel that they would be better off you know, if they weren't living anymore, that no one really even noticed if they weren't around. I'll let Kim describe these next slides. So you'll also see they can present with a lot of anger and aggression. They can be physically acting out. We actually see a lot of this in teenagers. Um, So it's hard to see if it's just them being moody and not wanting to do things or if it really is that depression, but they have a really difficult time controlling these feelings. They also have a lot of negative statements and worldview, kind of that helplessness, hopelessness. Nothing they do is correct. Um, No matter how they think, it's always in that negative lens. They're not good enough. No matter what um, they try and do, they're not going to accomplish the goals they set out for. Um, And then also self-mutilation. This is one where people harm themselves. It can be... um, 
kind of superficial scratching. They might take a pen or a razor and make little cuts on their arms. A lot of times teenage girls will actually cut on their stomach or inner legs, so it's not so obvious for you to see. Um, they're really good at hiding it. So um, it can also be cigarette burn marks. It's usually up and down the arms, um, places where they try and hide it. And next we're gonna discuss some of the suicide risk factors. First of all, we're gonna go through some of the positive coping skills that you'll see with people. Um, some of the really important things that you look for are um, a strong faith. You know, they're going to church, they're attending church groups with their family, um, family events, whether it's sports, going to family dinners, um, other things that families enjoy doing together, spending time with friends, um, exercise is a big one. If you see people, you know, they join a gym, they have sports that they enjoy and are outdoor activities. Uh, different hobbies, whether it's camping, hiking, um, artwork, music. And one of the really important ones I especially like to discuss with teenagers is rest. Um, we really see with a lot of our teens, when we go out and evaluate them in the community, that a lot of kids just aren't getting enough sleep. There are a lot of really um, big school demands, you know, where they have a lot of homework. Um, I'm surprised in my own kids, I have teenagers myself, who come home and sometimes they don't finish their homework till 10 p.m. That's on top of their regular school schedule where they're, you know, doing sports and outside activities. So, I mean, really, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dahl, I include this quote right here, he's a professor of psychiatry at U uh, University of Pittsburgh. He says that young teens and young adults they should be getting anywhere from 9.2 hours of sleep a night. I don't think uh, there are many of our kids that are actually getting that much sleep. You know, we're, we're lucky if we're seeing kids out there getting five, six hours of sleep sometimes when it comes to all their demands. So as you can see with depression, um, usually those positive coping skills get overburdened by how they're feeling. So there's a lot of um, issues that may be going in to contributing to their depression. So this could be feelings of loneliness, if there's marital problems, it's really um, taxing on them when their partner, um, when they're having issues dealing with their partner. Also financial problems, and then if there's a history of abuse or if there's current abuse going on. So all these weigh into some depression. Uh, other things that will um, exacerbate the, uh, the mental health issues and depression, especially are alcohol use, um, illicit street drug use. Um, anyone that's had a description of chronic pain, or they'll describe things like fibromyalgia, um, they might have chronic conditions, or being, you know, patients who are being treated for cancer and have a severe pain issues. Um, family history of depression and suicide. Those are big red flags for us. When we go out and assess people in the community, uh, that's one of the main questions that we always ask is if, there's, if you know anyone or have a family member that's ever committed suicide. Huge risk factor. And then continuing with that is recent stressful events. If someone's returning home from war, if they saw combat, there's a lot of nasty things that people are seeing when they're overseas. Um, if there's accidents, if they're the victim of a crime, um, that can also add to it. And then like Brian was mentioning, suicide of a family member or friend. That's really challenging to cope with. Uh, some of the concerning behaviors that we'll see, um, if you have a friend that's making uh, final arrangements or they've been giving away personal belongings and effects to uh, family members and friends, um, someone who's purchasing weapons, you know, expressing an interest in firearms or other weapons when previously they weren't a collector or someone that was a firearms enthusiast, you know, just all of a sudden out of the blue, you wonder why, um, you know, grandma has decided she wants to go buy a pistol. I mean, that's, that's a huge red flag, um, something you would definitely worry about. Uh, poor self-care is another. You'll notice that people, you know, they'll, they'll stop bathing. Um, maybe they're, they're not combing their hair the way you used to. Just not taking care of the personal appearance the way they once used to. Um, also, saying goodbye is a huge thing. Um, people will say, you know, I've, um, they might make a statement that, you know, you've always been a good friend to me, and I just want to let you know that no matter what happens, I've always loved you. You know, they might not be saying it outright, but people will you know, say their goodbyes to family members and friends. You just have to be willing to, to listen and open your ears up sometimes. Okay. 
So once you recognize that someone is showing some signs and symptoms of depression, you come to the point of, what should I do? Listening when your family member or friend describes what is happening. You don't have to say anything. Just let them vent it all out. Just let them tell you what's going on for them. Next thing you want to do is every time someone makes a suicide threat, you always take that seriously. Uh, never minimize a suicide threat or a, or a statement or a gesture that's been made. Um, people don't manipulate often, you know, when, they're, when it comes to making a suicidal statement. And it's just not something, frankly, that you'd want to take, you know, your chances and, and say, oh, they don't really mean it. If someone says they're suicidal, please call someone for help. It's so important. One thing to talk about these suicidal threats, now that we're in a social media um, society now, these threats are not always going to be verbalized to you, but you may see these postings on Facebook or Twitter. Um, kids are texting more. Even adults are sending these text messages because then it's kind of a faceless way to get your message out there. They're not actually hearing you voice these concerns. You just get to write it and send it off and kind of hope that no one comes back to you and talks about it. So um, that's also more areas to look um, for some of these warning signs. When someone's making these uh, gestures or you know expressing these feelings, do you always want to do your best to remain calm and supportive? Um, it's obviously a very emotional topic and really hard to deal with. It's, it's hard to sit there and ask someone, are you thinking of hurting yourself or thinking of killing yourself? One of the toughest questions you can ask a family member or a friend, but it's such an important thing to be able to do if you really care for someone and you have a feeling or suspicion that that might be going on. Don't be afraid to ask them if they are thinking about suicide. Just because you ask, you're not going to put that idea into their head. Um, so don't be fearful of opening up that dialogue and talking about it with them. Um, and then ask them, how can I help? What would be helpful for me? What do you need? Um, and then you can proceed from there. But asking them what they need, they're going to take you in that direction, and that's going to be the best way to help them. Next thing we'll be discussing is how to get help. One of the first things you could do um, is to call the Access and Crisis Line. And uh, you'll notice in your outlines, in, in this particular section, I included all the information because I felt it was so important. I don't want people to have to you know, speed and write it. I don't want anyone to miss this information. So the Access and Crisis Line, they're um, available 24-7. It's a local toll-free number. Um, they have licensed mental health care care professionals that uh, man those lines. It's basically, it's a suicide line, and they can also get people hooked up with um, the proper community resources if they're having problems with depression or things that don't quite meet the crisis level. If it's really severe um, and imminent, you can drive the person to the nearest ER. All emergency rooms um, can actually evaluate and assess if a person is at risk for an immediate danger to themselves, and they can um, provide a safe environment for them. There's also behavioral health hospitals. Um, are those in the handout? No, I didn't. Okay. There's, um, if you call the Access and Crisis Line, they will give you directions, the names, what insurance these hospitals accept, but there's... Um, there's quite a few throughout all of San Diego County, so they're, they're available. And uh, if it's a really an emergent situation where someone's actively trying to harm themselves or they have a weapon, uh, you also want to make sure that it's a situation where they are safe to be driven in, where you don't feel that they would attempt to do something to harm themselves or harm you while you're taking them in. Because sometimes when people are really not in the right mindset, I mean, they, they could become dangerous not only to themselves but to you as well. So always make sure it's a safe situation prior to driving them in. Next thing you could do um, is you can call 911 for help. When you talk to the call taker, ask for the PERT team, which stands for the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team, and a clinician, if we're available, will respond along with an officer. So when you do call 911, there's some really important information that you can provide that helps get your loved one the help a little bit quicker. We need you to remain calm. Um, so you can be clear in giving that information. So give their name, date of birth, a physical description in case they leave before the police are, um, before they arrive on scene. Give 
behaviors and statements that they're making. If they threatened suicide via text, if they um, were cutting on themselves, if they started giving away their information, you can give them a brief um, summary of their psych history if they recently were in a hospital um, or if they have a history of trying to hurt themselves. And then let the dispatch know, are there any weapons in the home? Um, that's a big one that we want to know if we're going to walk into a situation, potentially there's firearms, swords, um, whatever else may be in the home. Right. Also, um, one of those things when it comes to um, some of the, the threats that might be made, a situation that Kim and I both run into quite a bit is where um, people say, I don't have the nerve to do it myself. I, don't, I can't actually hurt myself. I'm going to force the police to kill me. Um, so they might walk out with a toy weapon, something that, you know, similar, say that they have a gun and force officers to, to act. So uh, that's, that's a really unfortunate position to be in. So if there's been any statements like that, please make us aware of it ahead of time so we can um, plan accordingly. This last piece is what to expect. So if you do call 911, you're going to have a uniform law enforcement officer show up on your doorstep. Um, if PERT comes along, you'll see a clinician. We wear blue shirts. We have a radio. We wear the bullet-resistant vest. We um, match the law enforcement how they, they present. So you'll know if there's a PERT clinician that comes on scene. Um, officers secure the scene. They make sure it's safe for everyone that they're talking to, themselves, and then us as their partners as a PERT clinician. Officers in PERT will then speak with the person in the reporting party. So if you're the one calling, you're the reporting party. So we want to hear from you that good information that made you so concerned to call. Um, and then once the evaluation is complete, we come to a conclusion to determine what level of services might be the most beneficial at that moment. Um, and then the biggest thing with the police and PERT is we can do what's called a 5150. It's a welfare and institution code, and it means we can involuntarily hospitalize someone. So it means we're determining that we feel they cannot be safe if we leave them in their current situation, and we want to make sure that they get to a safe and secure environment. One of the four important things to remember, though, is if we do place someone on a 5150, when we're working as either a PERT clinician or it's a, an officer doing the 5150, um, we'll transport them to the hospital in the police vehicle or even in an ambulance, depending on what's the medical necessity. Um, I just, the really important thing I want to stress, though, if someone's placed on a 5150, it's not an arrest. It may very well look like one. They're going to be getting into a back of a police car. They're going to be transported by a police car sometimes but they're not under arrest. There's not going to be a record of this because mental health records are strictly, pro they're confidential. I mean, federal and state laws are very strict and are not going to be shared with anyone other than the, the care providers that we go to the hospital and give a medical report. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you guys being here. And we're going to open this up for questions. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking and for their presentation. Thank you for that. I, let's, let's dive into some of the questions that are being asked of the presentation. And before we do, I'd just like to talk for just a moment, if you could tell us a little bit about, and certainly, Dennis, you, you, you have expertise in this area as well. What are the, the most, uh, the, the persons who are at most risk for suicide? Can you talk to us for just a little bit about that? Who would, what age group and type of person. Sure. Um, right now, based on statistics, the biggest risk group is middle-aged um, Caucasian males. If they've been recently divorced or separated from their partner, if they're possibly unemployed, if there's financial problems, you're going to want to look at a lot of those current stressors. What are some new things that have happened to them that are really overwhelming and difficult to deal with? Okay. And help us to understand, why is that particular age group the most susceptible for this? I think just with uh, statistics and the demographics have shown that um, they're the, the group that's, that's acted on their impulses more than any other group. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times um, they may be firearms owners, veterans of the military. Mm -hmm. um, they're familiar with firearms and their use, um, especially 
you know, given the current economic situation, uh, there's a lot of people that are really um, despondent about their financial futures. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they made investments for the future and you know, just don't see a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, we, you know, studies have shown that that's just the, the group that we're really worried about if we get mm -hmm. a call about. So this is, you're talking about middle-aged Caucasians. We do the, know that men, if they do commit suicide, they do it in a more heinous, aggressive way. So like with a gun or hanging or something other than, say, pills or something. So it tends to be more imminent uh, with the attempt. Now, talk to me for just a moment related to... So we, we really have... Women tend to face depression almost twice as much as males, and yet it's the inverse of that for suicide, that males tend to commit the suicide Am I correct in this? You could correct me. So you're right. Males are typically more successful, um, yes. as terrible as that term yes. sounds, um, but because they technically use more lethal force. Lethal force. However, women attempt suicide, um, I want to say it's almost four times more often than men. Mm -hmm. It's just that men are more um, likely to complete suicide. Because what we're, we're talking about is just to set a baseline here, that typically when we're looking at people, that women do tend to experience depression more than males do. Now, it's very uh, intriguing when I say this, unfortunately, that the middle-aged male Caucasian, one of the research projects would suggest that that particular Caucasian is one of the more isolatory persons on the planet. And so they're less connected than others. So connectivity is so very important when we begin to talk about suicide or depression. Um, you know, the Bible talks clearly about never neglect the gathering together of the saints, but encourage each other all the more as you see the day drawing near in the sense that we're made to be in relationship. Dennis, were you going to add? I was just going to say that that population of the middle-aged white male is probably less likely to seek out therapeutic help as well Yes, and admit a need that is present. Mm -hmm. So that kind of complicates the situation even more. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, uh, that women have better support groups or more mm -hmm. open to speaking to their friends or loved ones about their feelings, where um, men will, you know, historically try and act stoic, mm -hmm. um, see if they can handle the problems on their own and not let anyone really know how they're actually feeling. Yeah, because we like to fix it, don't we? Correct. Yes, yeah, so we compartmentalize it, we fix it, we're okay, and yet it's not fixed, is it? That's one of the, and, and it's true that it, it's up in the 70s, sometimes there's research that says almost 80% of all calls to a therapist are females. So it really supports what you're just suggesting about that males don't tend to reach out uh, for the help that they, they need. So just a little bit of foundation. You want to add anything else to when we look at depression or? Well. I think the truth is is that, speaking from a male perspective, a lot of times you can tough your way through it. You know, you, you can get through to the other side, but why do that? Why waste so much time in, you know, maybe six months or a year of your life struggling and fighting with depression when if you ask for help, uh, oftentimes that depression can be treated and uh, worked through much quicker. So. Uh, from a male perspective, I would just say to the men, uh, you know, when you ask for help, you actually can work through it faster than uh, on your own. Okay. Let's talk just briefly, and then we'll go right into the questions. But let's talk about, explain what depression is. Let's just talk just briefly about when we think of depression, how would we define that? Uh, is, I get up on Monday morning. Um, actually, am I correct? At one point, the stats said that uh, the greater majority of uh, suicides were on Monday morning between 6 a.m. and 8. I don't know if your research shows that. Um, it sounds like a stat for preachers is what it sounds like. <laughs> I may have used it when I was preaching one day. I got a response from the prayer team that said, whoa, that sounds unusual. It sure preached well when I used it. I got a lot of response from it, but I did read that. I wasn't just uh, saying that, but that there's a tendency that, you know, I've had a, maybe a good weekend and now, oh, I don't really like my work. A lot of people don't enjoy their work. And so I'm just, I'm not feeling real good. I'm, I'm kind of a little anxious. Maybe I'm a little sad that I have to go to, to work. Um, can you give us a description? What uh, I think Kim and I, what we see when we're working out in the field along with law enforcement, um, typically most of the calls that we respond to start in the evening hours. Mm -hmm. When people have gotten home from work, um, they start drinking. 
So usually about five o'clock, you know, people have had a little bit of alcohol in them, maybe had enough time to get in an argument with the spouse, and then that's when the statements start and the behaviors escalate. Is there a particular day? Um, as far as particular day, I haven't really noticed. I'm, we do regional studies, you know, to try and get our PERT teams in the correct areas. Okay. But every every region has its you know peculiarities. Mm -hmm. um, so we try and spread things out evenly. But I I think it's more time based than anything else. I would say the evenings until late evening is when we get the majority of our calls. And when you have the majority of your calls, uh, do you have any level of inebriation or a level that someone's using any sort of narcotics or any, do you see that as part of this or? Well, we definitely see that, you know, people are often, you know, um, will be using alcohol, um, lots of street drugs involved. Um, but to me, alcohol is one of the worst, um, you know, things that I'll see involved because it just, you know, if someone's depressed, alcohol is going to make them more depressed, mm -hmm. um, more irrational, um, more likely to act on these impulses they're having where they normally wouldn't, tip, you know, act on some of these things, that, these feelings that they're having. Okay. Well, let's, please go right ahead. I wanted to add, um, someone who's struggling with a mental illness, especially depression, it's upward more than 80% will also use some sort of stu substance. So, um, typically it's alcohol. Um, or then some street drugs, or even now we're seeing over-the-counter pills, a lot of Oxycontin, and some of those pain, re, um, pain relievers and, and medications. So mm -hmm. there's a strong component um, of using drugs and alcohol. Okay, and then I have one more question, though. It caused me, after you said that, to ask this. Um, at, at least the, what I had been reading was that you have those 65 years of age and older. These are the protected classes. 65 years of age and older, and those under 18 as a very fragile class of people uh, uh, susceptible to suicidal ideation plus the committing of suicide. How would you put that and, and name that with the middle-aged Caucasian? Well, um, definitely, you know, we're always weighing risk factors when we're working out in the field and we're responding to calls. Um, we get so used to doing it off the top of our head. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it, but when we're assessing people, we're looking at you know the, their age, their economic situation, their work situation. Um, maybe they've had a breakup. Uh, you know, because typically when people have had marriage problems that might be later on in their life, they've been mm -hmm. married quite some time, then they're going through a divorce or having these financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. But again, it's those teens that I really worry about also, because um, I think of impulsivity, mm -hmm. um, lack of, you know, that awareness of consequences or, or long-term effects of what the decisions that they're making out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I have a teenager making suicidal statements, I definitely take that very seriously. Yes, and you said earlier that someone who has attempted suicide is much more likely to be susceptible to attempt it again. Yes, and to add to that, They've already crossed that line mm -hmm. where they're no longer just thinking about it. They've already um, thrown aside their anxiety and nervousness about doing it, and they've already done it once. So once they've attempted, they're not concerned anymore about trying it again because they've already done it once. They kind of um, they have experience now with it, so it's, it's easier to get to that point than if they've never tried it before and only... Yes thought about it. Yes, and we have uh, holes in the research for those who have committed suicide, and I'm not trying to be humorous, but it's difficult to gain information following a suicide from the person who committed. So it makes it very difficult sometimes to understand what was happening previously and what was the mindset to then, like, step over the line and to commit it. I'd like to jump into some of the questions. Thank you for responding to my questions initially here. Here's one question. Our 14-year-old son was diagnosed with depression one month ago. He is seeing a Christian therapist, a medical physician for medication, and we pray for him. Should we ask for him to speak more to us about his feelings? He's rather quiet about them. And Kim, you actually addressed this. That was part of in the, the presentation. Could we talk for just a moment about, we lean into someone then that says, I'm feeling depressed, I may want to hurt myself. What do we do? Uh, I, I would feel a little nervous maybe uh, trying to lean into that. As a therapist, I wouldn't. But I mean, normally people would think about that, that it might, I might increase their feelings about suicide. Talk to us for just a moment. I'll start. As a parent, obviously you want to let them know that you're there for them and that 
Um, you may not understand where they're coming from and how they're feeling, but you want to understand and you are there for them to share that information with you. So you don't have to be aggressive and kind of demanding that they share that, but let them know when they're ready to come to you, you will always be there for them. Whatever time of day it is, whatever's going on, you'll be there. Um, but at the same time, um, continue to follow up with their treatment. Make sure they are getting that support through the medical doctors, the therapist, and possibly increasing their support system out in the community. Um, you want to increase that positive support system, so you kind of want to know who they're hanging out with and what's going on, um, because they are at more risk for using drugs and alcohol, so you want to make sure those friends are, are pretty good peer influences. So when we talk about adolescents, we're referring to they oftentimes are not able to verbalize, but the symptoms, the symptomatic issues might be abdominal pain, they might have aches, mm -hmm. uh, they, they might uh, feel agitated, am I correct? Correct. Um, you'll see them anger easily when you broach topics or when you're mm -hmm. trying to t attempt to speak to them. Um, you think you're a typical teenager, they're, they're not real verbal as it, you know, to begin with. Mm -hmm. So especially when it comes to a really touchy topic like this, I think it really, you know, the parents need to be persistent continue mm -hmm. to check in on their feelings, see how they're doing, but you have to be really cued into those, um, those physical symptoms that mm -hmm. you're seeing, those outward signs. You know, are they staying in bed? Are they isolating a lot? Um, I mean, one of the things that we, we go into homes a lot, you'd be amazed at how many kids have laptops, computers, um, access to the internet in their bedrooms. These, a lot of teenagers will go home, um, they'll go, if they're not beginning their homework, but they'll immediately go onto the computer in the room, close the door, and they're not coming out for the evening. That's really worrisome behavior, and I mean, mm -hmm. it really breaks my heart to see you know, families in a restaurant sitting down, and they're all on their smartphones texting, mm -hmm. instead of engaging each other, speaking with each other. You know, everyone, the technology is supposed to bring us closer, but I think it's done just the opposite. I think mm -hmm. it's made us less likely to engage each other and talk about some of the harder topics. Yeah, it actually connects impulsivity to what I'm viewing. So if impulsivity is increased for a teenager, they would be more at risk for suicide because they could act on their impulsivity. Dennis, excuse me. And, and um, it sounds like he is in therapy. Uh, and speaking as a therapist, m most therapists are going to welcome a loving, supportive parent uh, in, as a part of the process. That doesn't mean that you're going to be in there for every session, for the whole session. But I would make sure that the therapist understands that uh, you want to be of help, you want to be supportive, and usually between the therapist and probably with a 14-year-old, they would uh, talk about uh, including you in on part of that therapy session, and that could be very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. I want to just park for just a moment on this, this particular, I'm actually doing research on this topic of adolescence and media. And this is very fascinating because we see a lot of media that is connecting pleasure with killing. So they're on Assassin's Creed, uh, and they're, they're watching someone or they're killing someone, and they find pleasure in that. So now they have attached pleasure to anger or pleasure to killing. So now we've really increased their impulsivity is what I'm hearing you say, and that can lead to lots of anxiety. That's where it goes initially. And anxiety always cohabitates with depression, a level of depression. The comorbidity typically always happens. If they're depressed, they're going to have some anxiety. If they're anxiety-ridden, they're going to have some depression. So it is something for those, those of us influencing children around us, maybe to have a sober time during the day. No media in the bedrooms past 9 p.m. Right. Now, what's difficult, you just said that we need 9.2 hours, or 9 hours at point two uh, that psychiatrists did per night and then children are staying up later, sometimes more than their children. Can you give advice for, because I know you, you have uh, children as well. I just met your son for the first time. It was great to meet him. I, uh, it's good to sell. I, I guess when my kids were younger, I, I was kind of a funny dad because I would make sure that my kids got about 10 hours of sleep a night. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, especially when the sun was out later, I'm getting them ready for bed, beginning to read to them, and they're like, Dad, the sun's still out. <laughs> and it might seem ridiculous getting your kids to bed, but I mean, you think of how long it takes a child or a young teen to actually wind down, yes. begin to relax, uh, develop a good routine for sleep habits. It takes quite a bit of time for someone who has so much energy to, to actually lay down and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think it just comes down to being the parent sometimes and you say, you know what, you can complete some homework in the morning before school, it's okay to wake up earlier if you need to, but you need to go to bed by a certain time. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have my kids wake up early a little bit and begin some of the, those last little parts of their homework rather than staying up to midnight mm -hmm. trying to finish homework because I think it gets to a certain point in the evening where you're so exhausted, you're not really doing good work anyways. You know, it's, it's hard to think and, and really concentrate on your studies. So it's gone to a point where it's just, you know, you cut your losses, get your child to get some, get some rest, and they can pick up and start again in the, evening, in the morning. Mm -hmm. Very good. We know that uh, it's bordering on YouTube is the, almost the number one or number two site for teenagers under 18 years of age. So very good point you're making. The second question relates to the very first question. Dennis, you were able to address it from a therapeutic standpoint. What do you do if your child, who is obviously very depressed, will not discuss it at all? We talked a little bit about that they might shut down. Uh, how do you help him? How do you help, say, a child or an adolescent, for that matter, who will not express? What would be the first steps? It's a very good question. What do you do if your child, who is obviously very depressed, will not discuss it at all? <laughs> Someone in the well, audience said, don't I, look at me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it may be that uh, the child won't discuss fe the feelings of being depressed because oftentimes they don't have words to express themselves. But I would ask for uh, the support group to come along beside me and to say, uh, my, my son, my daughter needs help. Uh, what can we do together? And that might look like uh, maybe the, a youth pastor in the church. Um, it might be a therapist. Um, it might be a school counselor. But uh, as a parent, I would want to make sure that I was getting all the support that I can uh, to bear on my child. And that communicates a couple things. It, it says, I am concerned about what's going on, and I do care about you. Uh, and so, And I think those are two good messages uh, that you can uh, communicate to your child. I think one of the things I like to fall back on also is the fact that when someone does make even a kind of a, an underlying statement saying that they're thinking of, of harming themselves, um, we can't ignore those statements. It's so important because sometimes people throw that, that lifeline out there just wanting someone to grasp onto it and pull them in. Um, because in their minds, a lot of times when they're making that statement, uh, making that gesture saying that you know they're thinking of harming themselves, they figure, well, if I'm going to give people a chance to help me, but if no one does, then I might as well do it because it's not going to even matter. They didn't even notice. Mm -hmm. yes. As a parent, I'd also um, encourage you to find some comfort knowing that your child is connected to another support person where they do, your child has the opportunity to talk to them and actually share those feelings. Most teenagers do not want to talk to their parents about what's going on, especially if they're struggling with some thoughts um, where they don't feel like they're good enough or, um, you know, they, they are thinking of hurting themselves. So just know that when they are connected and increasing that support system, that's really important and beneficial. Okay. Again, you're bringing up the very, very important point, and that is isolation. And even media provides opportunity for people to isolate. So even leaving doors open, if there is a laptop, have the, the screen facing the door so you can see that. And our teenagers and others are isolating, actually, many adults. Where the, when we look at this, some of the, uh, the, the games that are being sold today are not necessarily the younger set. It's, it's about 28 to 32 to 34 years of age. And so you even have young adults who are in isolatory places. So it's important to be reminded of that. This next question, my daughter has been on Accutane for five months and will be finishing up at the end of February. She has experienced some bouts of depression during that time. But my question is this. How is this depression possible if she normally never experiences this? If I remember correctly, um, Accutane can have the side effect of, um, of depression. Um, and I think I would definitely talk to their, their care provider about some of the symptoms that were being experienced while taking this medication because um, they would either consider weaning off the medication or 
possibly prescribe something else that might help with uh, some of the feelings of depression to go along and, and minimize some of those effects from the medication. So we should be comfortable talking directly to our physician and saying, I really don't understand this. Could you please take time um, and, and assert ourselves to get the information that we need? Because we as parents know our children the best of anyone on this planet. So even if with our physician, it would be mean that we would be assertive with that right. to try to make sure that we're clear. Right. And, and any time a medication is being prescribed, it's so important to talk to the um, this prescribing physician about the side effects and the possible things to look out for. Um, there's so much information online. Um, you can even go to a bookstore and buy a nursing drug handbook that lays out in very simple language uh, side effects um, of medications. So you can look them up yourself. Um, there are so many new medications on the market all the time. I, I'm running out into them in the field, and sometimes I don't, oh, I've never heard of that one myself. I mean, it, it's just changing so rapidly. And uh, we're finding that, you know, some of the medications that are prescribed to adults have a completely different effect on our teens um, because they still aren't at a developmental stage. So they might react to them very differently than an adult would. Yes, yeah, there's lots and of questions. And that's the that. same for um, older adults, too. Those adults 65 and older are very sensitive to medication. So um, something that may have worked when they were 50 may be twice as powerful as they get older. So it's really important to talk to that physician. And if you notice any changes in your loved one, that you do refer them back to the physician and you share that good information because a doctor's not going to know that just when your loved one comes into their office. They really are going to rely on you guys to give that helpful info to make sure their depression is not increasing, their thoughts of suicide, um, especially for, for this little girl. Um, it's important to share that info with the doctor because he's the one prescribing it, so he's going to be able to be the one to make those changes in a healthy manner. I think something that um, you could do as a parent also is to keep a journal um, every day to, and ask, ask your teen, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your mood today after they've taken the medication? And just rate it daily because, I mean, if you, you try and remember off the top of your head, it's very difficult once you're in the doctor's office to remember questions that you have or what your child is experiencing. So just do a quick journal daily of what you're seeing when they're taking this medication so that way you can describe it to the physician when you go back in for an appointment. Excellent. Let's go into the next question that's, that's taking us a little step further into depression. This person says, I'm bipolar. How does the depression in my disorder differ from the depression discussed tonight? So this person is saying, I'm bipolar. Let's first define that. And how does the depression in my disorder differ from the depression discussed tonight? I'll start by saying your depression is more complicated with the bipolar diagnosis because it means not only are you dealing with symptoms of depression but you're also dealing with symptoms of mania which is that elevated mood kind of feeling on top of the world you got increased energy um, you're more impulsive and you think you can accomplish a lot more than when you're depressed so you have two components that you're trying to deal with and manage um, However, your depressive symptoms, everyone's depression is going to be different. It's going to be individualized to you. So your symptoms can be very severe where you can't get out of bed for days. Um, it's kind of like the Eeyore um, presentation. Nobody likes me. You're just kind of shuffling around. You got that rainy cloud following you, and no matter what you do, you don't feel better. You know, that's kind of constant every day for someone who's going through depression. Um, so you do have a challenge. However, there's a lot of um, good treatment out there for those with bipolar. So even though you deal with those two components, it doesn't mean it's hopeless and nothing's going to work for you. Right, and people with a bipolar diagnosis, um, they're oftentimes very successful people, uh, people that we engage in the community, um, doctors, lawyers, very high performers. I mean, it's... it's it's a very common diagnosis that we run into, and it can be managed very well as long as you're very open to the idea of discussing these issues with your uh, psychotherapist, um, being honest with how the medications are working. Um, and also, it's, it's important to remember that if you've been on a, a particular medication for some time, that doesn't mean it's always going to work for you. Sometimes you may have, you, you might notice your symptoms are, are reappearing you may need an adjustment. Sometimes you have to do a voluntary hospitalization, ask your doctor, say, you know, my, my medications just aren't working for me. 
and they'll actually do what's called a small drug holiday where they'll wean you off that medication for a few days, begin you on a new regime, and, and start you on a new medication and see how the effects are. Mm -hmm. Help us to know the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Can you talk to us for just a moment about that? Uh, because you begin to describe the, the mania where I have a lot of energy, maybe euphoric, and then I have the depressive piece. Uh, so with bipolar 1, you have um, an extreme manic phase and an extreme depressive phase. With bipolar 2, you have the extreme depression and then your phase of mania. It's called hypomania, so it's not as severe as full-blown mania, um, but you do experience a lot of the symptoms. So... Um, not to say it's less severe, but that upswing is less high than when you have bipolar one. So if we have, with the bipolar one, so I have a major mania phase. Tell us what that looks like. Is that several days? Um... It, it could depend on, person. some people are what are called fast cyclers or rapid mm -hmm. cyclers. Um, but sometimes when someone's very manic, they, they can almost get to a point where they're psychotic. Mm -hmm. um, they will think that they're indestructible. They'll oftentimes be... Um, make statements that, you know, they're a very important person, whether they say they're a general or a Nobel Prize winner. I mean, they present in very different ways. Um, sometimes they're very convincing. I've been fooled myself on occasion. It just, <laughs> and, and they believe are, it, huh? They, they believe it. Exactly. Me. Yeah, they, they believe in what they're saying. Um, but again, they, it, it's that very manic phase where they have tons of energy. They stay up for days on, on end. Um, they, they might be doing several pr different projects at one time. It, it might almost appear to someone on the outside as someone who's under the influence of methamphetamine, but mm -hmm. they may be completely c clean of any drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're usually very impulsive. They're, um, that's when you might see a lot of spending, big spending, lots of cars, or they're going on trips. Um, gambling is a big issue when someone is in that manic phase because they're on the go, they're unstoppable, they feel great, they're going to win big, um, and, you know, they're on top of the world. So no one's going to tell them any different, no one's going to bring them down, but they have that increased energy. They don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat, they're just on the go. Um, a lot of them are, the, you know, the president's wife, you know, Princess Diana, they're the Queen of England. I mean, they, they really believe that they are these... Um, high-powered people. Um, you also notice with ladies, um, it'll be very apparent in their dress, whether they're wearing a lot of makeup that's, you know, sometimes considered bizarre, um, you know, lots of, you know, lots of lipstick that's actually exceeding the lines of their lips, mm -hmm. heavy blush, uh, heavy mascara, really bright clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people in a full-blown mania are very hypersexual. Um, so they put themselves in very risky situations, and they're very vulnerable to being victimized. Um, you know, prostitution's a big thing for women. Um, just because they're on that role, they don't realize those consequences that can happen to them. So in a manic or depressive state, uh, when does a person become angry? Now, we have lots of people who are anger-driven in a bipolar experience. Can you talk about that for just a moment? I think lots of times people become angry, especially when a family member addresses some of these behaviors or some of the concerns they might have. They'll become very defensive, um, and then it gets to a point where it's just, you know, especially if they're manic, it, it becomes over the top and can actually become a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, you know, people who are, are, are bipolar and very manic become aggressive to family members when they have no previous history of being violent towards yes. others just because they're so impulsive and uh, at such a state that they don't want to be told how to, to live their lives and, and what they need to do. So even though that there's an euphoria connected with the mania, that's where you're feeling on top of the world, maybe even for three or four days and don't even sleep even. Mm -hmm. And yet in the midst of that, that euphoric feeling can present as anger. Right. There's, there's definitely an edge to the way they, they, yes. they present. Yes. So it's important to see that because I think sometimes people struggle with that and they, they see someone... They're thinking, wait, this is a mania position. They should be feeling just on top of the world, but they're angry at everyone, and that impulsivity causes an agitation, which is what we were talking about related to depression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we were talking about, we want to, I really went on a, a, a little trail here of bipolar, but I think it's important because um, this person that was asking how it differs uh, from that, but I think you're making a very good point. There's tremendous success with certain medications 
uh, particularly with bipolar, because it's so devastating for, for the person. This, this next question, is it seems simple, but yet I think it's profound. How do we best support one in depression? How do we best support someone who is in depression? Be available for them. Um, it's pretty challenging sometimes for people with depression to come out and share their feelings, but when they're willing to talk, kind of jump on that moment and be that support system for them. I, I think you might even see this a lot of times, you know, after someone's lost a, a loved one, and, you know, people are really quick to say, oh, please, please call me if there's anything I could do for you. Hmm. I think rather than saying, call me if there's anything I could do for you, you make an offer, say, you know, you show up and say, this is what I'm going to do for you. Yes. Because when people need help, when they really need it, they don't typically ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk to us for just a moment. What does a person experience with depression? I asked this earlier in a way, but I'd like to ask it in a different way, if I may. What have you heard, and even, Dennis, with your experience in the clinical room, uh, what have you heard people say when they're depressed? What are some languaging, verbiage, ways in which they describe depression. Can you give us insight into the, the mind that is experiencing, and body that's experiencing depression? I heard a man describe it as a funeral in his brain. Wow. Um, and it, just, it was just an overwhelming sense of foreboding um, where truth becomes, it, it's almost as if truth is a lie. And one of the, I think with milder depression, one of the things we want to do is challenge the thoughts that they are having. But with severe depression, it's very difficult for that person to even rise to that level of saying, that can't be a true thought, because they are convinced that that depressive thought is truth, and everyone else is a lie. Um, and I think that's... Um, important for us to distinguish tonight, too, is that, the, that there is a mild and, and a more of a moderate and then a more severe depression, and they do present differently, and we want to treat them differently. Certainly as a therapist with mild or moderate depression, uh, we can do quite a bit uh, with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, challenging some of those thoughts, thought replacement, and uh, it can be very successful. With more severe depression, we, re we really count on a physician to come along beside us uh, because oftentimes that person is not even able to help themselves because they are so depressed and medication can help them help themselves and then uh, we come along beside and uh, work with them on that. I had a teenage girl describe, she actually had bipolar and she said when she was experiencing depressive symptoms, it was a rain cloud that followed her around, and it was very dark, um, and she would actually visualize rain sometimes coming down on her. And then when she was lifting out of that depression, um, it cleared up, and there would actually be like some sun rays coming through on her, and that's when she knew she was doing much better. So with the darkness that both of you described in a way, would it be a lack of feeling? Oftentimes I'll hear patients say that I, I'm losing feeling. I don't necessarily have feeling for something. So it's, is it a numbness? Is that, would you describe it that way? Or? A definite numbness and it's a definite inability to feel any pleasure, whether it's happiness, joy, laughter. Yes. Um, that is what they are really out of touch with. You know, they may have been someone who enjoys seeing comedies and laughing with their family and they just describe not being able to do that anymore. It's just not funny. Nothing is funny. Nothing makes mm -hmm. me happy. Mm -hmm. Even things that used to in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, this next question ties into this as we were responding to that. What is the best response to a child who says she hates herself? That does sound like a level of depression, perhaps. What is the best response to a child who says she hates herself? That's a tough question to answer. It's we don't a, know the child. A, it's a very <laughs> difficult question, but I, it it's definitely you know, depends on the age. You know, the, yes because there are different, there are appropriate responses for each age, but I think the, the main thing you need to do is, especially with a younger child, is describe to the things that you love about them, the things that are important, the things that you see that they do that make other people happy. And then you really just need to have a, a very good discussion with them. Uh, and I, I've also seen a recent study where it said sometimes when people are very depressed, 
when you give too many uh, false compliments, you know, you try and over exaggerate, yes. that makes them feel even more depressed mm -hmm. because then they just don't believe the things that you're telling them. So it needs to be really fact and reality based when you're giving them compliments. Mm -hmm. And then just have that discussion with the young child and ask them why that would make a statement. Because it's often, often tied to something that may have happened at school, maybe. Mm -hmm. They had an argument with the best friend or someone's bullying them. Um, you need to find out what that trigger is so mm -hmm. you can really address the situation because it's, it's not like they're really having a, a deep thought and thinking about all the things they hate about themselves, but rather it's, I hate myself because I messed up on my math test today and got a bad grade. Right. It's usually tied to something. So depending on the age, a person can ruminate. They can cycle with it, stay with that because they're still developing the ability as... Uh, some developmental theorists would suggest that I, I repeat things and then I'm learning them as I repeat them. And if I'm a little impulsive with my depression, then I might begin to repeat something. I'm not good at this. I'm not good. I'm not good. And then having a normalized, real response that they can believe could be helpful mm -hmm. at that point. Yes. You could even follow up to that statement with, tell me more about that. Hmm. what's going on. So find out what that statement means to them. Um, and to piggyback, you know, even do that with, if they say I want to hurt myself or I'm going to kill myself, ask them what's going on. Because sometimes kids say that if they failed their math test. Mm -hmm. It's such a um, very common statement now that it's almost okay for kids to throw that out there. So challenge them by asking them what they mean and then you can kind of go from there and see what direction they're going to take you in but make sure you're not bringing your impression and understanding into that find out what their meaning is behind that statement so if my child says that which it is a common and i become anxious that's what i would do as a as a father i would become anxious what's happening now to the child but I'm asking a question, actually. I wasn't trying to make a statement, but what is happening to the child? If, oh, n no, you're not. You're, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. So now I'm anxious, projecting that onto the child. What's happening to the child if I do that? Which is not what you were saying, Kim, we should do. You were saying the opposite, to, to invite the child to express. But if I become anxious, which is typically the case for parents, unless we're practiced, in this and knowing how to respond, Dennis? And I think what happens, your anxiety really cuts off conversation because the child's go, oh, mom or dad is freaking out. I'm not going not gonna to say anything more because, you know, I don't want the, the hassle. So that's where you have to really back off, back off a little bit and practice those kind of probing conversations that uh, elicit more of the response and, uh, from, from your uh, son or daughter. It's so important when you're having these conversations with your children or with your teen to, to mirror the behavior that you, you expect to see from them. Mm -hmm. So if you want them to present calmly, well, you need to be calm yourself. Because if you're anxious, then it's going to invoke anxiety in, in the person that you're speaking to. So really try to be a mirror of what you want to see. That's kind of the homeostatic position that we, we like things to be calm. So we'll do catastrophic responses to try to calm mom and dad down maybe. And be honest with them. You can let them know, as a parent, that concerns me when you share that information. That makes me nervous. It lets them know that you're human and that you're normal and you don't want to create a big deal out of this. You're glad they came to talk to you. But let them know. It might help them, too, knowing that um, this is a scary place to be, and not just for them, but for you also. So as Brian said, modeling. You're talking, Kim, about modeling the fact that you can name what you're experiencing and we can learn to manage it. Uh, and so that, again, does what you were saying, Dennis, kind of drawing out the emotion uh, of that child or, or person. Yes. This next question is very perplexing. We're running a little short in time, but this one is a challenging question, so I wanted to preface it with that. And yet I've heard this question and statement many times from my patients. Sometimes suicide, it's a statement, but we, we want to treat it as a question. Sometimes suicide um, may be the only solution if you're hurting emotionally and physically. So someone is saying that sometimes suicide may be the only solution if you're hurting emotionally and physically. How do you respond to that? That is a very difficult um, you know, question to address. Uh, people, when they're in the throes of their depression, will often feel that that is the only and the final answer. 
Um, but I, I, I was listening to um, interviews of people who had actually had a suicide attempt by jumping off the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. And the, the people that were able to, to go through this process and talk about what had happened and the, what their thought process during the times, all of them said that they felt that that was the final solution. And every time they said that they actually acted on that impulse when they, when they jumped, the first thing that went through their head is, Oh my, oh my goodness, what have I just done? Yes. It's that moment of clarity, and it's, it's too late at that point. Yes. Um, and, you know, they, 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 a lot of these people recovered very well because they, they remember that thought that ran mm -hmm. through their head saying, oh my goodness, I just did something that's permanent, and there's no coming back from this. Mm -hmm. um, I think oftentimes when people have that thought that, you know, suicide is the answer, they still forget to think about the permanence or, or, or how it's going to affect their family members. It's a really difficult place to be in. And uh, when we, we arrive on in situ, you know, a situation like that as a, as a crisis response, I mean, really the only answer when someone's making a statement like that is to hospitalize them, to get them to a place where they're going to be safe and have access to weapons, um, be in a, a calm environment where they can actually start doing mm -hmm. psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the depression itself in this case overwhelms the person from being able to cognitively, using the frontal lobe, be able to understand what they're doing. And it's very powerful the way you, you said this particular reading read that, that there, be, there was that clarifying moment, but yet it was too late. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it supports the, the, the biblical standard that says we're not allowed to take our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, but anyone else want to respond to this? It's a very, very powerful question that's being raised, and it's one that many, if not all of us, uh, have had loved ones or someone raise this question. It's maybe not a good answer, but just um, a response to that is it shows the severity and the seriousness of these thoughts and that they really do take control of that person and they don't see another way out. So... Um, you know, not minimizing, but really letting them know that you hear them and you hear that seriousness to it um, because that's really the place where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I think you're making a very good point, both of you are, thank you for that, is that when someone is understood, heard and understood, it validates them as a creator, creation of God. And when we are validated as someone God has created, that can help us to change our position of the emotion. The emotion overwhelming us, and we can gain insight that we are really always working. If you think about the homeostatic position of, you know, if I became nervous and fainted, my blood pressure would go down once I fainted, and, and I'd go back to a normal breathing and all of that, and my hot head would begin to cool down and all of that, uh, that we're made to work to always come to some level of peace. But when the emotion is there, that's why I think it's such a difficult question. It's overwhelming for the person. All of us probably, all four of us here have been with, sat with, certainly I know all of us have, someone who said, no, this is my only way out. And it's a very, very painful place to be with another human being. So you've made a good point, several, that really listening and trying to, to deeply understand, if we can, what that person's experiencing authenticates it may not cure the, the problem right at the moment, but it truly does authenticate them as a creation of God. Very important, significant. You know, Christ went to the cross for that person. If there were no one else, it would be for that person who's in that deep depression. And, and there's no immediate statement or therapy that you're going to do that's going to fix that situation. Right. It's going to require some extensive work. Yes. That, that's really a dangerous statement to be made. You're going to have to request some, some sort of outside help at that point if you hear a loved one making that statement. Yes, and if they're making that statement, you would not leave them alone. You would, you would make sure that there is someone mm -hmm. who officially can be of help. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other statements to that? It's a really powerful Tough, tough, tough one. We have just a few more minutes here. Um, this person ties into what you said earlier about if someone has tried to commit suicide, that they are much more likely, depending on how time, many times they have tried, to commit it, be committed to suicide. I've already tried suicide. How can I prevent this from happening again? That's the question. I've already tried, sui tried suicide. 
How can I prevent this from happening again? It's a great question. We haven't really, really addressed that this evening. I'd encourage you to seek out professional and professional support, so that could be possibly medication and also a therapist, someone that you can learn how to overcome some of these thoughts, really get a strong group of positive coping skills, so then when these feelings do start to creep up and you do think that suicide may be the only way out, um, that you have a bunch of other steps you can take before you get to that point where you're trying it again. Um, Increasing that social support system. Um, It could be through other members of your church here, um, a support group of people who may be going through the same type of issues and feelings. Um, Really surround yourself around people who can be helpful for you. Um, And don't try and do it all by yourself and and alone. And sometimes that can be very difficult. So even if we have a friend and say, I can't really provide support for me, would you help me? It's like Carl Menninger back in the 60s, I think it was 1969, he said, whatever happened, he wrote a book, Whatever Happened to Sin, but he's the one out of the Menninger Foundation who said, if you're depressed, quote, lock up your doors, go across the tracks and do something for somebody. We know if a depressed person can do that, they are going to feel better. So sometimes it's even asking a friend to help me that I, I can't do this, but I know that I'm isolating and I, I need help in that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other responses? How can I prevent this from happening again? I think one thing you really need to be in touch with, with those thoughts that you're having, um, because the lies that your mind are telling you that you're not doing things right, that you, mm-hmm. you, that you aren't worth something, it's a progressive buildup you know of these thoughts Mm -hmm. and as they begin to increase you need to you know find that person that you trust whether it's a family member or a friend that you can confide in and and run these thoughts by them and and tell me is that true about me or is that just me being off the wall i mean can you look for some sort of validation that tells you the opposite of what you're feeling about yourself Mm -hmm. um and if you notice that no matter how much you're talking through these things um if that's not enough, you need to get to a point where you need to make an appointment with uh, your health care provider, mm-hmm. uh, with a therapist, and really start doing the work of, of adjusting whether you're on a medication regime and adjusting those medications or, or looking for some more intensive treatment so you can address these issues. Mm-hmm. And you're making a good point. Dennis Sistel is one of our therapists who here, and I know you have colleagues that are therapists, and you have your cards in the back here this evening. We would never do a presentation like this without someone that's readily, readily available to help. So I, we hope that you might utilize uh, these individuals as support as we leave this evening. Well, we have about two minutes left, and I just wanted to uh, mention our next week, but I want to thank I want to thank our panel, and I'm sure that you would join me in thanking them for their presentation. Wonderful, wonderful professional words of encouragement to us this evening. Would you join me? We, were, we almost moved through all of the questions. We did not get to all of them, but we had a few, few left. But I wanted to mention our next presentation, which will be uh, next month, and that is on Wednesday, uh, February 5th, Resilience, Grieving and Growing Through Loss. It's almost following up this uh, presentation, um, and Yolanda Gorick will be our presenter. She's actually a specialist in this area. In fact, she just lost her father, unfortunately, this last week. Uh, she's going through her own grief related to the loss of her father. She's been caring for both parents for a number of years, and his was Alzheimer's and uh, suffering from that. But for years, she presented this at a very large church in Van Nuys and did for years presenting this particular topic. So I, I hope that you'll invite others uh, to join us uh, next month, February 5th. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we are going to close for this evening. Thank you again, each of you, for coming this evening. We hope that this has been helpful. I just want to remind each of you that we do have these audios on the Skyline uh, website. At some point, we will be having the DVDs uh, produced uh, to try to help others that may be able to receive such good words from each of you. Thank you again, each of you. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much. You gave us the gift of life. You believe in life. You said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. And you have hope for each of us. And what a very delicate, difficult topic this evening. And yet, thank you for your presence that made all the difference in each of our lives. The Holy Spirit can speak truth to each of us individually and uniquely in ways we can never do as humans. So thank you, Father, for your presence here tonight. 
that is making all the difference. We love you. We bless you. We honor you this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.